I'm Rosa Mendez, and I'm here at the number one Long Island broadcast, Monty Ferro. I have the best time ever. Hey, listen, Daddy. You're listening to the number one broadcast, Monty and Ferro, Daddy, in Long Island. The best pro wrestling broadcast of all time, I think. Jimmy, I got to tell you, man, it feels good to be back on YouTube. It was uh, quite disappointing what happened to us, but we bounced back pretty fairly quickly. Well, what, what else would we do? We're almost at 5,000 subscribers. Well, speaking of that, man, yeah. we need more members. Okay. What do you think we need to do to get the people of those 5,000 subscribers to come on and, and join the team as a Monty and a Faro member? Nudity is out of the question. Any other ideas? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I don't know. But what I, I do have a few ideas. Well, just like Prell, they should tell two friends, and they can tell two friends, and so on and so on. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Check out all our content. But that's You know what? That's why you're, you're the star of the show, because guess what? Members get special content. Even we spoke about it. Farrell came to me one day, and he goes, man, what's the deal? I can't even watch some of these videos because I'm not a member. And I said, there you go, Farrell. You got to be a member because this is what the members get. They get free content that nice. none of the other fans that watch this show get. That's right. You get free autographs from some of these wonderful stars that come in, right? Nice. All you do is you go to the MNP webpage, or, right, our own page, yeah. and shoot us an email and say, hey, man, I want a picture of... Tommy Rich, I want a picture of whatever. And boy, that's on its way. We give them their choice. That's right. We rock. We do rock. And you need to rock too. Join. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the second edition of This Week in Pro Wrestling History with me, Bruce, and I've got the player <laughs> over here, Benny Scala. What's going on, Benny? Hey, Bruce. Well, you know, I got to tell you, it's been a rough couple of days lately. Hey, uh, why? what's going on? Well, I went to go see my psychologist. <laughs> How'd that go? Well, she, she told me that I suffer from delusions of sexual superiority. <laughs> she just wants to fuck me. <laughs> I told her to get in line. <laughs> you are the player, so why not? Yeah, get in line. Oh, that's right. Ooh. Players got to play. So uh, yeah, last week we had a fun time uh, yeah, going through, yeah, it was great. Through, through history. And then um, what happened on Thursday? Uh, when you with, on Thursday, Thursday, we were on a, a show together and uh, somebody lost their title. Oh, that show, that show. <laughs> I'm in denial, I guess. Yeah, it was close. I, I, I lost by two points. I, I think I got screwed on a couple of my takes, but you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you, you yeah, I'm bashing Edge for a minute and a half straight, and I, I didn't even finish, and I only got two points on that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I looked, you know, I talk, I'm, I'm doing the take. And I remember I, I remembered what my score was before I started. And then you, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm, this is at least a 12-pointer, and I'm going to be at this number. And, I, like, I only got five points. It's like, what the? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, well. You know exactly. what? It gives us more motivation to, to do better next time. Absolutely. That was a lot of fun. Actually, it seemed like last week. But first week was great. Last week was even better. Yeah, it'll get better and better, I'm sure. So what we're talking about is on Thursdays at 8 p.m., Betty and I are on another show on the network called This Week in Pro Wrestling, where Mike Monty gives us a topic and we basically go off on it and we get points based on our creativity and our knowledge of pro wrestling. So you got to check that out. So, uh, yeah, Be Betty, uh, how, did, uh, how did the interview last week go on Dan and Benny? Fantastic. And we got another very good one this week. We're really looking forward to it. Um, it's going to just be really exciting. Um, and uh, tune in is all I can say. I, I don't know if I should give a spoiler or not who it is. No, it's up to, that's up to you. This is coming out. Yeah. Don't forget, this is going to be coming out Wednesday morning. Right. Actually, why don't I say who it is? It's going to be uh, Harvey Whippleman, uh, a.k.a. Downtown Bruno Lauer. Awesome. Yeah, that should it be should great. It should be a very a very fun and very exciting interview. Yeah, a lot of people don't know how how much history he has in pro wrestling. So He does. I mean, people think that, you know, they remember that that short stint when he was in the WWF and he was a referee, but he's actually been in the wrestling business, believe it or not, since 1979 when he was 14 years old. Yeah, I've heard a, I've heard a couple of stories and yeah, you know, I can't very, wait. Yeah, very interesting stories. Yeah, I I can't wait to watch. So yeah, you want to get this uh you get this week in wrestling history going? 
Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we're going to start off on October 9th, 1982 in Chicago, Illinois. Why don't you yeah. take it? Yeah. Uh, on that date, October uh, 9th, 1982, Chicago, Illinois, Nick Bockwinkle defeated Otto Wands to regain his AWA World Heavyweight Championship. Um, and it was um, he actually had uh, Wands had defeated Bockwinkle on August 29th, losing it 41 days later. And uh, rumor has it, I, I mean, it's actually reliable, good sources that he actually paid Vern Gagne 50,000 bucks for his title run. So, and Juan was a, Juan was a legend in Germany and uh, believe it or not, was one of the few men to body slam Andre. And one of the dear guests from uh, Monty and the Pharaoh, Mike Halleck, uh, trained uh, or was a prominent figure in Hans's, uh, not Hans, Juan's uh, CWA, Catch Wrestling Association. Yeah, I've uh, I've done a little bit of research. I haven't gotten to watch a lot of it, but that whole round thing seems pretty interesting where they, they literally kind of, they have rounds like boxing rounds and they kind of mess with each other in between them. So it's pretty, pretty cool. I, you know, uh, Wands is, uh, you know, well known for that. And yeah, it was, uh, that's pretty cool. Definitely was not well known for his AWA title. It was very oh. lackluster. And like I said, he just, you know, I guess Vern needed some cash. So maybe, I mean, I, mean, I wish I had 50 grand back then. Maybe he would have made me champion for 41 days. Yeah, right. He could buy the title. <laughs> so, I don't think we could do that anymore. No. I mean, if we gave well, uh, Chris McNair, Triple H, a million bucks, maybe he'd give it, he would do like that thing with like Nicholas, the, the school kid, but with, I think, uh, Braun Strowman. I think with AEW, if you gave him enough money, they would just create another title for you because they have enough of them. So, you know? they, yeah, they do. But what's, you know, they, what's one more, right? <laughs> So, uh, hey, let's move on. Let's move on. What about 1969 in El Paso, Texas? Yeah, uh, Eddie Guerrero, Latino Heat, was born. And what can you say about him? I mean, the, the not only Eddie, but the whole family. I mean, it was a great wrestling family. And, I mean, Eddie, in the short amount of time, because he – I mean, he had a, a rather lengthy career. But, I mean, there was so much left to it, but he did it all. And he was phenomenal if he was a baby face or a heat or, or heel. And uh, his in work, in ring work, was absolutely flaw flawless. His charisma was off the charts. And uh, we talked uh, last week, I guess, about Brian Pillman being found dead in his hotel room in Minneapolis. Uh, same thing. Uh, that Ed, I, I think it was two thousand five. I want to say yeah, two thousand five. Uh, I believe so. And you know, although Eddie did it all, he left in the prime of his career, and he still, I think, he still had his best years ahead of ahead of him. And there were so many more greats. I mean, the feuds that he could have had over those next, say, maybe even five, seven years, mind-boggling. I mean, yeah, he, he was, I mean, he was so the top of his game. He was so, so young. And, you know, and, and I think about it because, I, you know, watching him, in, you know, doing the Cruiser stuff in WCW and, you know, just watching his career. He had a lengthy, lengthy career. But it, at, at the same time, it seemed like he had so much left on the table that he could he could do. Yeah, he was getting better and better. I loved his... Uh, when he would uh, take a chair and he would bang it on the mat and then he would throw it to the, when the referee's back was turned, he'd throw it to his opponent and then he'd just take a, you know, just flop on the mat. Referee would see him on the mat with, you know, the opponent with the chair. They, they got a DQ win. Yeah, that was <laughs> classic. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so let's go on. So on the uh, same date in 2006 in Orlando, Florida, Kurt Angle made his debut for TNA. Well, what can you say about this? This is really TNA's second biggest signing. At that point, they had already brought Christian Cage over. But, I mean, this really legitimized TNA as a competitor to WWE. Uh, at that time, they, they had already switched over. But, yeah, I mean, what what a what an impact player. You know, WWE did not want to bring Kurt back, and they were really discouraging him because of the neck issues. But, you know, the... Uh, TNA was willing to take uh, take a chance on him, and let, let's face it, he uh, he had a great run there. Yeah, and uh, I when whenever I think of Kurt Angle, I always think of that when he had the uh, that little cowboy hat on. That just that, <laughs> always. If I ever like you, know, you have those go to things that that you know, if you need a good laugh, you could you could think of something in a crack ship every time. That's one of mine. That was just priceless. I never thought that. I mean, Kurt Angle his his reputation as an Olympic wrestler and an, as an athlete was, you know, without parallel, but who would have thought that he would become the, the personality that he became? I mean, he, unbelievable. He, he had it all. I mean, that was one of the wrestlers that probably should have also gone over into acting that didn't. I mean, 
he uh he the charisma the he could play both sides he could be that angry heel but then he was like the the com- the comedy uh the, the the jester on the side so it, and and he was one of those guys i mean the, i wouldn't ever want to mess with brock lesnar <laughs> ever but i mean right behind him would be somebody like a kurt angle i mean i can only imagine how legit tough that guy was and probably still is and APB, American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. That's right, folks. K9 Corral. For all your dog daycare and overnight care, call 631-549-1544. That's 631-549-1544. Okay, so let's move on to the 10th in Bay St. Louis, Missouri. What happened there, and where the hell is that What is Bay St. Louis famous for? It's famous for shitty pay-per-views, I guess now it is. So uh, this was the location of the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view. Like I said, arguably the worst ever. Uh, it was supposed to be the first in a series of pay-per-views. It was gonna, actually going to be like a semi-nostalgia act. It was supposed to feature stars of the 80s, maybe in the early 90s. And uh, those plans were unfortunately scrapped after a low buy rate and an intoxicated Jake Roberts simulating sex acts with his snake. And just to clarify, uh, the, the, the snake that he brought into the ring in a bag. Well, I guess to further clarify, not the one-eyed snake. And although the event was heavily promoted, uh, the total number of buys was 29,000, uh, falling just a little bit short of the 40,000 views needed to perpetuate the series. The Wrestling Observer actually cited this as the worst major re- wrestling event of the year, probably of all time. And uh, Meltzer, Dave Meltzer gave the match between uh, Butch Miller and Luke Williams. They could not call them the Bushwhackers, I guess, because of uh, copyright uh, infringements against the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. He gave that a minus five stars. Uh, they did invite many other you know, star wrestlers, but most of them declined. And uh, Gordon Soley was supposed to be the commentator. And in my mind, Gordon Soley and Lance Russell, they're one and one A. But he fell ill, unfortunately, and uh, more unfortunately, uh, a few months later died of throat cancer. And, you know, as great as Mr. Sully was, I don't think he could have saved this. No, I agree. I, I have to agree. I, I think he dodged a little bit of a bullet there with uh, not having his name associated with his pay-per-view. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that was something he wanted to add to his life. So here, here's a question. I was I just popped into my head as we were going through that. So I understand they couldn't be the Bushwhackers, but why couldn't they have been the Sheep Herders? Yeah, I guess they could have been. They called them, I think they called them just Butch and Luke. But I can't imagine it would have been a, a, any kind of trademark on the or copyright on the uh, on the sheep or the kiwi sheep herders, the sheep herders, whatever they were before. Man, when I remember, I mean, I remember the first time I saw them. It was uh, the Southwest Championship Wrestling, uh, you know, the, uh, for, out of San Antonio. And those guys were brutal. I mean, I, I, Jonathan Miller, I guess, and uh, Jonathan Boyd, I think it was his name. And I think and Butch Miller. And man, oh man, I mean, every time they got in the ring, it was a bloodbath. And then they come to the WWF, they're the Bushwhackers, and it's, you know, it's a comedy act. Yeah, I have to say, my exposure, I was I, probably nine or yeah, probably eight or nine, I got to watch them. I was down in Florida visiting my grandparents, and my grandfather was a big wrestling fan. And man, they were they were just so violent. I don't know if that was like UWF or... Were NWA? I'm not maybe Georgia. I don't really remember. It was it was such a long time ago, but uh, I just remember them being so like violent. And then they came to the WWE or WWF and were that uh, fun loving duo that uh, <laughs> got a, got a second life as a comedy act. I, I have a quick bushwhacker story. Actually, I think it was around ninety three or nine, but around ninety two, ninety three, and uh, I was living in Kansas City at the time. And my mom was still around and she, you know, I went, I came down here to Florida to, uh, to see her. And I'm at the Tampa airport because I always need my liquid courage before I get on any, any plane. I don't care what time of the, of the day it is, morning, noon or night. And, uh, I see these two familiar guys at the bar and it was them. It was Butch Miller and, and Luke Williams. And I said, you know, I said, I'm a huge fan. 
started uh, having a drink or two with them. And as fate would have it, um, they were right behind me on the plane. And we, we continued our, our socializing and uh, as well as drinking. And uh, I made the remark that uh, uh, I watched wrestling, which is a true story. And it, it's actually it's actually this week in wrestling, October the 11th, which is the next date we're going to cover, October 11th, 1980, that I watched wrestling on my wedding night. And uh, <laughs> this, the flight attendant happened to walk by just as I said that. She's, oh, wow, aren't you romantic? And she gave me crap the rest of the flight. And I guess rightly so. But great guys, though. They're really, really nice guys. Nice. So let's move on to October 11th. And we'll go back in time to 1977 in Memphis, Tennessee. How, you know, I, I have the feeling. So this is only the second episode. I have the feeling that there's probably not going to be a week that goes by that we don't cover at least, you know, two, maybe even more events. Because... It's just so prevalent in, in, in the history of wrestling, things that happen in Memphis. But on, the, on this particular date, October 10th, 1977, Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler defeated Doug Summers, who was substituting for uh, Bar Zukov and sold out Houston off. Hopefully I'm saying that right, uh, to win the AWA Tag Team Championship. And now when I hear that, you know, whenever I think of Memphis wrestling, there's three names that come to mind. Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, and Lance Russell. They were the epicenter of what is to me, uh, the best territory in the history of wrestling. To, to think that Memphis, so Memphis is a small market location. I did a little bit of research. It's only 48th in the TV market in the United States. So it's not really, you know, not a big city by any means, but how they could routinely sell out the Mid Mid-South Coliseum week after week. I mean, for years, and we're talking years, like, you know, 20 years is a testament to the greatness of these guys. And, you know, as well as Jerry Jarrett, who's the promoter. You know, Bill Dundee uh, on his best day was five foot seven, but he was he was able to make those fans, and they they were very hardcore fans. Believe that he was legit. He was he was a little tough little sob. I'll tell you that he, he sure was. And uh, you know, five seven. That's what he was billed at. You you know uh, you know what that means. Yeah, he's probably five <laughs> five four. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, while well, we're on the subject of uh, people about five foot seven, on uh, October eleventh in nineteen eighty eight, Trevor Dean Mann. Known to the wrestling world as Ricochet was born. Well, I, I have to say, I would have never, when I was a kid, Ricochet would have never made it to the WWE or F at that time. And he would have never had that mean, the mainstream uh, exposure that he's gotten. But man, if you go back and look at what this guy has done in wrestling, he has done it all. You, you name the, uh, the promotion, he's been there and he's done it. He, from, uh, you know, over in Japan, down in Mexico, he, from you know the lucha stuff, it's guy has been everywhere. Uh, didn't I? Amazed he made it to the WWF or E at his size. I mean, he's only five foot seven, five foot eight, and you know, 180, 190 pounds. But man, he's made an, he has made an impact there. You know, I mean, I think of the territory days, and I I call it the Bruiser Brody test. Uh, so if I want to, in my own mind judge the legitimacy of a wrestler i think to myself well what would have happened if you know they got in the ring with bruiser brody like i i put like miz how long would miz last with a bruiser brody before you know or, or a orange cassidy or somebody like that and i have to put this guy in the same category not that i mean he is very very good at what he does i mean don't get me wrong as far as you know the the, the gymnastics and the acrobatics i mean he's probably the best there is or one of the best there is but you know, it just, I am not of the generation that, I mean, I, I, I'm, give me Bull Cur Curry and Johnny Valentar. Give me, give me a Flair Steamboat. Give me Wahoo McDaniel and Ric Flair, you know, two out of three falls. That's, that's wrestling. You know, this guy, I mean, Ricochet, uh, and, and by the way, Ricochet, happy 35th fifth birthday in two more days. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to slight you there, but yeah, I mean, he's, he, in in the current generation of, of the current product of wrestling, he's serviceable. Uh, you know, in, in in my definition of wrestling, absolutely not. <laughs> I totally totally understand that. I get it. I get it. But let's see where were we? So we're going. How about on uh, October the twelfth in nineteen eighty two? All right, and one more time, Memphis, Tennessee. Here we go again. So I, I think my prediction is going to be accurate. I, I bet you there's not going to be a week goes, that goes by that we're not going to have something 
that is Memphis related. But on this date, October 11th, 1982, which would have been my second wedding anniversary, uh, I probably still wasn't able to live that down with the Bushwhackers. Although that happened, that happened in the future. So I guess I could. But, um, so in this, on this date, Nick Bockwinkle defeated Jerry Lawler to win the AWA Southern Heavyweight Championship. Now we talked about, uh, we just talked about Nick Bockwinkle defeating Otto Wands to regain the, the AWA World Heavyweight Championship on October the 9th. This is only two days later. So two days later, he, he traveled to Memphis and he beat Lawler for that championship. Uh, and the, there, there was back in the day, back in the territory days, there were some very, uh, prestigious titles like the intercontinental championship when it first came out in 79 was you know for the for wwf it was the definitely the number two title the missouri heavyweight championship was one of the elite territory titles but the the southern heavyweight championship was also one of those so and we talked about ken patero last week uh, he won the the intercontinental championship he beat pat patterson four days later he beat david von Erich for the NWA Missouri Championship. So, you know, it's a pretty, pretty hard thing to do. And in my mind, uh, Bockwinkle, I mean, you know, they talk about the all-time greats. You always hear about Flair. You know, you hear about Briscoe. You hear about Hogan. You don't really, you don't really get Nick Bockwinkle in that discussion. And I think that's a shame because I, I, I think the guy was a complete package. I mean, I don't know how much, you know, the, the, the people who are listening, listen, listen, or listen to a Bockwinkle promo or two. Actually, listen to one with Bobby Heenan because those those guys were so good together. But you know, watch some of his work, watch some of his matches actually with Hogan. Uh, he he hung with with Hogan, and he actually made Hogan look good. And uh, you know, he, what happened was he was actually offered the NWA World Title, I believe, in the late seventies or early eighties, but he turned it down. And the reason why he turned it down is because he could wrestle. Uh, for Nick, for uh, Vern Gagne in the AWA for, and do like maybe 150 to 175 dates a year and make the same money as he would in the NWA wrestling with 100 more dates. So a no-brainer, stayed in the AWA, made good money, and to me, one of the greatest champions ever. I, I unfortunately didn't get to see much of him. What I, my exposure to him was in his later years, and uh, when he, the few that I remember him in is the one with Kurt Hennig, uh, with the uh, the roll of dimes, when head again. Yeah, that's after he had turned babyface. I mean, the guy was a heel for years. Uh, great, great. Uh, before that, was a great tag team uh, champion uh, with uh, Larry Hennig. Not Larry Hennig. I'm sorry, Ray Stevens. And yeah, just just one of the best ever. He always would use you know these hundred dollar words on, in his promos. And rumor or legend has it that. Uh, he would actually just look in a dictionary uh, like the day before his promo and just look up a couple of like really eloquent words that he probably had never heard of before. And he'd slip them into his promo and it worked. I mean, he, he sounded very cerebral. Jimmy, I got to take a dump. What? No, I mean, I need a dumpster. (sighs) Well, for all those needs, you need to call Big V Dumpster Rental, Long Island, New York, 631 900 Dump. Hmm. Elm Logistics. For all your logistic needs, call 631-299-3595. That's 631-299-3595. Elm Global Logistics. Pride, performance, and partnerships. Yeah. So, on... uh October 11th, 1999, Raw gets a 6.1 rating and defeats WCW Monday Nitro with a 2.6 rating. Look at that number, 6.1. That's I bet they'd love to do that now. <laughs> I think, well, it, you know, and with these ratings, if, if something is on at the same time, you got to wonder how much duplication was there. So I'll, for me, like I was guilty of flipping back and forth. I think a lot of people were. Back in the day, I you know, think if you, had, if you yeah. had a crap. But by this you? point, I, oh, absolutely. But by this point, this was in the, uh, wasn't this in like the Russo run era where it was really starting to stink up? The, the, oh, this uh, is when it, yeah, this is when it sucked. I mean, this is really after the N, uh, NWO, NWO had had their, their, their run. But I mean, that number is mind boggling. It's something to think about. The 6.1, I believe, would equate to about, 
I could be wrong, but I'm going to be close. Eight million viewers. Wow. To think that on a Monday night, eight million people were watching wrestling, and w- w- what's the count now? Maybe two million. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking at some of the so, matches from the night. So some of the matches you had: Ivory versus May Young for the women's championship. Oh, let's that see. night. Yeah, that night. So how how old was May Young? Like about 107. <laughs> that, that... Right. Oh, let's see. They had Billy Gunn with the Road Dog against Crash Holly with Hardcore Holly. Uh, Edge and Christian versus The Brood, Matt and Jeff Hardy. Uh, X-Pac versus Farouk. Uh, Godfather with the, with the Hose versus Mark Henry. Big Show versus The Big Boss Man. So, yeah, you know, pretty much the who's who of, uh, of wrestling at that point. It's, it's funny. Some of those names you mentioned, that's going to be, what, 24 years ago in two more days. Yeah. And you got Edge and Christian, you got Billy Gunn. These guys are still wrestling. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know uh I know some people are looking forward to Edge in the uh AEW. I'm I'm really not or well Adam Copeland. I, I'm not I really don't want to see the uh the geriatric match with where they bring back the Dudleys and they have like a uh you know a, a, a wheelchair nap and you know diaper match or something like that because they're not gonna you know they they're not gonna relive those matches from the early two thousands. Well, I mean, do you think, what do you think is going to happen with, with uh, Adam Copeland and AEW? Well, so far, not much has happened. That needle didn't move on the ratings. Uh, but hey, that's a whole other story. I don't, I don't know. I hope he's there. He helps develop some of the younger talent. I've never been a big fan of his, but, you know, his early, his early days as a tag team wrestler, I did, I did enjoy him. But once he broke into the singles ranks, I, I really wasn't a big fan of him. Um, I don't know. I, I, I lo- he says this is a new beginning for him, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And again, you know, the, the Bruiser Brody test, there's no way that that guy steps in the ring with the Bruiser Brody. I mean, he's, he's not, I mean, he's not out of shape by any means, and he's not skinny, but he's not, he's not what you had back in the day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So on a same date in 1945 in Austin, Texas, the legend. The American dream, Dusty Rhodes was born. Where do you start with with it with him? Is it Dustin Runnels? Virgil Dustin Runnels? Where do you start? He uh, he was the man in the seventies, the man in the eighties. Uh, he he was in the right place at the right time. He had that charisma. He had that voice. He had that jive. You know, everybody loved that dude. It didn't matter, you know, black, white, indifferent. Everybody loved Dusty. You know, they gave him a horrible gimmick as the plumber when he got to the WWF in the late 80s. Guess what? He got that over. Right. The polka dots. Yeah, the po- yellow polka dots. Oh, man, Dusty Rhodes. What a le- what a legend. And then, you know, somebody you know, continued to give back, even in his later days, helping to develop other people and their promos. And when you think about it, I mean, you go back to the early 80s and you see like the, the people like you had uh, Terry Funk, you had Ric Flair, you had Briscoe, you had Harley Race. Now, none of them were, were bodybuilders, but they were like in pretty decent shape. Um, and then you have Dusty Rhodes, who I don't think he ever saw, saw the inside of a gym a day in his life. And the fact that somebody who looked like that not, I mean, not that he couldn't go in the ring. His work was good, but I mean, his, like you said, the guy was absolute magic on the mic and he had the people in the palm of his hand. No, absolutely. Let's see. So in, um, let's move on to the 12th. Well, let's see, actually, let's check some time here. No, we're, we're good on time. Okay. Um, let's go move on to October 12th, 1983 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Very sad day. Ernie Roth, the Grand Wizard of Wrestling, died at the age of 57. You know, it's really funny when when it happened. I was 28. And I'm thinking like, well, he was, you know, he was old enough. But now that I think, like now I'm 68, I think, damn, he was young. But, I mean, such a, a legendary and wonderful character in the history of professional wrestling. So his he first appeared um, in professional wrestling as Abdullah Farouk. In the uh, he was uh, the manager of the original Sheik in the Sheik's uh, big time wrestling territory, which is based out of Detroit. And he came to the then WWF in 1971. Uh, I think he managed uh, beautiful Bobby Harmon. I think was his first uh, 
his first uh, protege. And in 1973, he led Stan Stasiak to the WWF Championship over Pam Morales. And then in 1977, he was in the corner of superstar Billy Graham when, uh, when Graham defeated uh, then champion uh, Bruno San Martino in Baltimore, Maryland. And he also managed Pat Patterson d- during his uh, uh, first inter- intercontinental title run. And besides that, he managed Killer Kowalski, Ernie Ladd, Ox Baker, uh, Sergeant Slaughter, the mass superstar, and like the list went on and on. Just, you know, the, the guy was a legend. Uh, he was so good at what he did. And it just reminds me of something that, you know, I always talk about things that were part of wrestling's past that are not part of wrestling's present. You know, one of them would be the draw. When was the last time you saw a draw? I haven't seen a draw like in 20 years. But, you know, one of the things is, is the use of the managers. I mean, back in the day in the 80s, and 70s, you had Albano, Blassie, and the Grand Wizard. Uh, then you had, who'd you have? You had Bobby Heenan, Mr. Jimmy Fuji, Hart. Jimmy Hart. Yeah. You had, uh, Slick. You had Downtown Bruno. You had Humperdinck. I mean, you had, you had Cherry. Paul Bearer. You had so many managers. You had Miss Elizabeth. I mean, every heel pretty much was attached to a manager. And now you got Paul Heyman. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, oh, uh, and a couple of women, the valets there, but that's about it. Yeah, like I mean, a Dakota Kai, she uh, she must know somebody because, like, I don't know what she's still doing, uh, collecting a paycheck. Well, she's from what I understand, she's injured right now, but they want to keep uh, her. Okay. Re- pres- uh, they want to keep her relevant on TV. All right, so she's. I saw her on, on Saturday night. She was quite irrelevant, but okay. <laughs> So, hey, listen, it's about that time. we got to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about Bret Hart and Ric Flair. So, All right. We'll be right back. All right. Sir? Ah. Manscaped? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, have you tried the new equipment that's been sent? I'm afraid because it says Weed Whacker. <laughs> I'm scared. Maven, Manscaped. What are you thinking about Love Manscaped, it. dude? You Love what? it. What do you use it for? Necessity. What? <laughs> What don't I use it for? Put it this way. The only hair I have on my entire body is these eyebrows yeah. that oh. you see. These wow. caterpillars racing to the middle of my nose. That's it. That is it. That's all, that's all I have. And that's all I want. That's the so pick. Manscaped is you, a must. We were talking before the show. There's nothing worse than just hair. Yeah. Right? Hair on a woman, hair on a man. It's just bad. Absolutely. And it's the one thing that the older I get, it starts growing more in unwanted areas absolutely i hate it i'm gonna ask you a question Uh-oh. just gonna go out there oh boy go for it you're doing a deed yes again i don't <laughs> want you to have to admit this because we as men we try not to admit this but if you're gonna go uh, do a deed where, on a woman I know would you rather going. have her be hairless or a little hair racing stripe or <laughs> racing stripe. full retro bush <laughs> racing well, stripe. retro bush is out yes thank you retro bush is out yeah um i don't mind a small, well manicured landing strip. <laughs> Every now and then, if it's completely, and I'm talking like baby's ass bald, mm. then I I start. Where, where is that pedophilia line yeah. that I'm that I'm I don't, I don't wow. want to wander into that. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like that. I never thought about. Wow. That. You're a smart dude. Holy yeah. shit. So if the landing strip is clean enough for the plane to go in smoothly, you're cool with that. If the landing strip is. Has like I said, well manicured. Yeah, you yeah. can see both sides. It's not like blinking lights on both sides of that. I just don't. I don't want. <laughs> you know, I don't want the shrubbery going off into yeah. unwanted areas on that. Gotcha. As well. Oh, yeah, look but, what you found. Ooh. I got to be all honest gotcha. though. Hey, the, ah. the, the older I get though, I don't. I think I don't think I can be as. Uh, <laughs> I, I found I, it. Have, I found have it. Have you ever gone down there and like just like you, she slowly brings down the underwear? Then what is retro? Just Absolutely. Retro. You're like, whoa. Wow. Yeah, like, I'm 46, like it pops out. Do you like walk out or what do you do? No, I, try, I muster through. I muster up the you courage to get a through. Trooper. Yeah. He's a trooper. <laughs> got to give him an yeah, not all not all heroes wear capes. Yeah, I, there you no, go. I hear you. Uh, <laughs> there you listen, go. Can't, I couldn't. I Super couldn't Bush. say. I couldn't say. Well. <laughs> If you have the same beliefs as Maven does, Manscaped could help you. Absolutely. The weed whacker. Absolutely. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that I may have to, like, you know, go in a room, close the door, and hang out with the weed whacker for a little while. Yeah, I think you're a retro guy, aren't you? I like 70s adult films, if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, with Ron that, Jeremy, we're going to take a quick Batman. commercial break, and anyway. we'll be back with this wrestling icon, Maven. We will see you in a drop kick second. A uh, drop kick 
Again, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Hey, Benny. Awesome. Awesome. So, like I said, we are going to get into Ric Flair and Bret Hart. So, on October 12th, 1992, at Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, whatever. <laughs> Saskatchewan. <laughs> okay, Saskatchewan there. Sas- Sask- wow, I don't want to try to say Saskatoon, that. Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Say that 10 times fast, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So, Bret Hart defeats Ric Flair to win his first. WWF World Heavyweight Championship at a house show. Yeah, at that was something. So did you you know the story behind it? I, I actually didn't until I started doing some research there. No, I you know, I, I just from my own personal uh memory that you know I I, I think I I was you know I was gonna watch that night. I, for whatever reason I was running a little bit late and when I turned it on, uh Brett had a belt. I thought, oh, he he, he got back the IC title. And then I, I, when I had to do something else, the next thing I know, I know he's being interviewed and he won the world champions. Like what the hell happened? No, I don't, I don't know the backstory though. So if you have, that's great. Yeah. So uh, just, to, it took me a little bit of digging, but uh, in an interview, Ric Flair said that on the previous evening, he ended up getting dropped on his head and cracked a piece of his ear canal. And so his Ooh. equilibrium was really, really off. And if you actually will, got to see that match it was probably the worst rick flair bret hart match that could have happened because rick flair couldn't he couldn't keep his balance at one point he ended up taking it um a backbreaker and he couldn't get back up for for wow. a minute and had to lay on on the uh on the mat from there he ended up rick flair ended up having to take six months off to recover from this and then he ended up he came back and then soon after that ended up leaving the uh the wwf I was surprised. The Ultimate Warrior, yeah, he uh, was a little bit of a known for those botches, but I guess he had dropped them on his head, and that's how we ended up with Bret Hart with the champ, his first champion. Oh, so it was it was the Warrior then? The Warrior. Oh, okay, so, yeah, he he was he, he was he was kind of rough. So the Warrior is the reason Bret Bret Hart owes uh, the Warrior a debt of gratitude for his wor- first world title there. Wow, yeah, did not know that. That's very interesting. Yeah, so uh, I was I was a little surprised. Yeah, but uh, so let's move on to October thirteenth, nineteen seventy five. I was about a I was yeah I was, I was a brand new newborn at that point. <laughs> really? So yeah. was I. I was twenty. Uh, <laughs> so on that date at Madison Square Garden, Bruno San Martino and Ivan Koloff ended, and we just talked about. I just said that you don't really see draws anymore. So they ended in a draw when the referee ruled that both men were bleeding too heavily to continue. And I'm just in utter amazement how this worked. I mean, WWWF for years and years and years, they they cycled in these heels from these other territories. What they do is they put them on TV, you know, they, they squash a couple of guys, and then eventually they, you know, they they defeated Dominic Danucci, uh, who was, you know, for a while the number two babyface, or they would attack Arnold Skolan, who was Bruno's manager, and that would set up a match at the garden. And if it was, you know, if it was if they went over well enough, they would extend it to two or three uh, matches. Just you know, and was this worked for years? And I'm not sure if it was Bruno. I'm sure Bruno had everything to do with it, but it was also uh, also McMahon as well. Um, you know, the guy was a, a promotional genius. And uh, now Koloff, actually, people think you know he, he came right in and beat Bruno. He was in the, the WWF in 1969. He lost many matches to Bruno. Came back in 1970, and then on January 18th, 1971, did the unspeakable and ended the seven-year, eight-month reign of the living legend. And I, I want to let that sink in. Seven years and eight months. And, you know, everybody, the, the today's re- wrestling fans, they're, they're going gaga. That Roman Reigns title reign is over 1,100 days. He's about a third of the way to Bruno's first reign. He, Roman Reigns, he, I don't think, has even exceeded or even half of Bruno's second reign. And uh, now the other thing to note is that Roman hasn't defended his title in over three months. And I believe if you look in three years has less than 40 title defenses, Bruno routinely defended his title at least 200 times a year. And, you know, on a side note, I think it's really a damn shame that Ivan Koloff is not in the WWE hall of fame. I mean, he, to me, that was the most significant victory in the history of professional wrestling. And the guy who won that match is not in the Hall of Fame. That's, that's sad. 
Now, and that's back in the day when they told story, real stories of the ring for an hour straight. Uh, they told story. Yes, there were a lot of rest holds, but you know they, they told the stories with their with their faces, with their actions, with their the smallest move meant something. It didn't have to be a big flip off the top rope finisher that somebody's going to kick out of. They sold it as it went along. I mean, those were the those were the uh, you know the real legends of the. Uh, and, and a finisher was a finisher. Nobody was nobody was going to break Bruno's backbreaker. Nobody was getting out of Billy Graham's bear hug. I mean, nobody nobody was getting out of Ken Patera swinging full Nelson. It just you know that was uh, now you know these guys get power bombed through nineteen flaming tables. And you know, five seconds later, they're making a comeback. So true. It's sad. it's that's it's it's sad. You know, they really these guys are putting their bodies on the line more than they need to. Probably shortening a lot of their careers more than they need to. Uh, but you know, that's that's today's product. Yep. So let's move on to the thirteenth of October in nineteen ninety in Toledo, Ohio. WWF airs the twenty eighth. Saturday night's main event, which earns a seven broadcast rating yeah. at 1130 at night. It earns a seven. And I think that would equate to close to probably nine or 10 million people. That's just amazing. So here, check out the card this night, because it's actually not known for being <laughs> the, the best of cards uh, at that time. Uh, so let's see. We have the ultimate warrior and a legion of doom defeating Axe smash and crush. You had Randy Savage with Queen Sherry defeating Dusty Rhodes by countout. Hulk Hogan and the ultimate wrestler, Tugboat, <laughs> defeats Rhythm and Blues, Bonky Tonk Man and Greg Valentine. Sergeant Slaughter defeated Coco Beware. And then the Texas Tornado defeated Haku with Bobby Heaton in his corner. Wow. Did they ever call him Kerry Von Eric or did they always call him the Texas Tornado? I don't know. I, I don't I, remember. I want to say when he first came in, he was the Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Eric, but soon they just dropped the Kerry Von Eric. It was like uh, the, the Widowmaker and the Stalker with Barry Windham, yeah. which was really a shame because, I mean, everybody knew it was Barry Windham. Come on. No, Barry, it's Barry. Barry was a talent that the WWF, that when he was younger, they did him right with the tag team run, but then uh, he should have he should have definitely had a main event run in WWF. He, he definitely absolutely had that, that ability. So we talked a little bit about this last week, but in uh, the Marine made its debut on this day in 2006. It uh, ranked sixth in earnings for that Friday overall. The film grosses uh, 22 million dollars. Uh, yeah, 22 million Fox. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is what it is. I still have seen none of the Marines. <laughs> I don't anticipate ever seeing any of the Marines. But yeah, I mean, I guess at 22 million, it probably made him a few bucks. And you know, it didn't didn't hurt the career of John Cena. No, no. So let's move on because uh we got yeah. <laughs> we I know we we'll neither on one of us has much to, to say on the, that one. Yeah, I did, like yeah, that's all <laughs> I got to say about that. So on October 14th, 1989, in Providence, Rhode Island, Tito Santana wins the King of the Ring tournament. There's somebody who just never could break above that mid card level. He had everything. He had the voice, you know, he had the, or he had the talk, he had the look, just couldn't get out of that, uh, the upper mid card level. And uh, at this point, I think it was what, at where he became the matador soon after and took a couple of steps backwards down the card. Right. You know, I, I, I for years thought that, you know, I felt bad for Tito because I thought he should have been given at least even a token run, you know, even as a transitional WWF champion, but then I think about the guy, I think he was in the WWF 15 years, and he had nice runs at, at, as the IC champion. He, when he came in, I think in 79, they put the tag team belts on him with uh, Ivan Putsky. So, I mean, the guy probably made a crap ton of money because he came in right at the right time. I mean, he was he was with the WWF right when the you know the, the, they became national and international. So I'm, I'm sure he's not hurting for money. And so I don't really feel bad for my, I, I like Tito Sant Santana a lot. I mean, I, I think he was very talented and I, I mean, I think, I, I think where he, you know, what he did was pretty commensurate with his skill. I, I mean, if he could not have been a long running WWF champion by any means, I don't think he had the, the charisma or the, I mean, he was over, but he wasn't like that over. 
if that makes sense. Yep. Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, he had that almost there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he he had his uh, from WrestleMania one, and then he, he was on the Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. He had his action figures. Yeah, he Strike Force was a a great tag team. I mean, he really oh, he yeah. was almost almost there, just not. You know, maybe a a couple of years later he could have done it, or a couple of years earlier, just didn't. Wrong time for him. That Hulk Hogan era is kind of like it's kind of like the Michael Jordan era in basketball. There were some great players that never got a championship just because of that man. So right, but I mean, what's that thing? Don't cry for me, Argentina. Don't cry for me, Tito Santana. Because the guy, I mean, the guy had a great career. Yeah, and from what I understand, he's actually a really nice guy. I haven't had the opportunity to meet him, but I know he's been on with Mike and Jimmy, and uh, a couple of my other friends have met him, and everybody says he's a really, really good guy. I have never heard a bad word about Tito Santana. Uh, everything I've heard is that he's just a great guy. So October 14th, 1995 in Syracuse, New York. What happens then? This is an infamous Not one. one of Shawn Michaels' uh, better moments. He got assaulted outside a nightclub in Syracuse, New York. And uh, I think this is one of these stories. This is like uh, Robert Stack, Unsolved Mysteries. We're never really going to know the truth. Um, apparently, you know, the one thing we do know is that Michaels flirted with the girlfriend of a 23 year old Marine at a bar. And I wasn't there, but I'd be willing to bet uh, that the hefty salary that I get paid for this show, that he was just the obnoxious entitled little prick that he often was back then. And there's many different accounts of what happened, you know, as far as how many Marines removed him out of his rental car and beat the ever loving shit out of him. Uh, I believe the police report said nine or 10, but it, interestingly enough, uh, and if if he comes back on Monty and Farrow, this is the one thing I want to ask Marty Gennetti. Marty Gennetti said it was just the one guy. And I'm likely to believe Marty this time. So it's between one and ten. And, you know, the funny thing was that Bill Watts at that time was the uh, was one of the bookers in WWF. And I can tell you that if this happened in Mid-South, that Michael's little boy toy ass would have been immediately fired. <laughs> and, if, and now, of course, WWF made it made it into a huge storyline. And uh, strip Michaels of the title. Shawn Michaels, he never lost the title. He always got stripped of a title. Or, you know, he lost his smile or whatever he lost. But uh, they gave it to Shane Douglas, but uh, who immediately handed back to uh, the fellow Click member, uh, uh, Razor Ramon. Yeah, well, I we will never know the truth behind that night. That's uh, that's going to be one of those infamous stories that by the, t- by the time, you know, 2075 rolls around. It's going to be a hundred, hundred Marines and the uh, the National Guard. You know, it took them all to to take down Shawn Michaels or something. I think it's been like uh, was it like the Zapruder tapes that it's been sealed for 75 years. <laughs> yeah, I'll be about 111 and I'll I'll get to find out what happened. So, on the uh, October 14th, 2009, Westchester City, New York. Our good old friend Captain Lou Albano passes away at the age of 75. Wow. I mean, what what can you say? I mean, we can take three shows just talking about Lou Albano. And I, I can tell you that when I became a fan in 1968, he was still a wrestler, uh, albeit not very good. And uh, although for a time, uh, he and Tony Altamar were known as the Sicilians, and they were uh, they were Midwest tag team champions for a bit. And uh, although I guess they got approached by some legitimate wise guys and said, uh, I think you need to knock off that gimmick. And then guess what? They knocked off the gimmick. But, um, you know, Bruno approached Albano one day, and he, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie uh, Caddyshack. Uh, well, who, who hasn't seen Caddyshack? But, you know, the, the thing when Ty Webb approaches uh, Al Sherbet, uh, uh Ronnie Dangerfield, he goes, you're not good. You stink. He pretty much told Lou that in, in nice words. But he did tell Lou that he thought he was a great talker and that Bruno would speak to Vince Sr. about making him a manager. And, of course, the rest is history. And uh, besides being one of the – I mean – I think Lou Albano would be on any uh, Mount Rushmore of the, the greatest manager. But he, the guy did more than that. He, I mean, he literally transcended pop culture into pop culture. I mean, he was in movies. He was on TV shows. He was in yeah, Cindy, Cindy Lauper videos. Brothers. Yeah. And, I mean, I think, in my opinion, I think Albano was very instrumental in ushering in the rock and wrestling connection. And I don't, I don't think he – really gets the credit that he deserves well, let, in assisting well, WWF into becoming an international uh, phenomenon. Isn't it the legend it was him sitting next to Cindy Lauper that launched it all on a plane? Yeah, yeah. 
So and then I, I could see the two of them hitting it off. I mean, I, I, I guarantee you, like they, you know, Cindy Lauper absolutely had a love of Albano and, and vice versa. But yeah, I mean, the, that whole angle and that, I mean, it eventually resulted in uh, Albano turning babyface for the first time. And uh, but I think that helped get the whole thing over. And it, it, we, it, it, it pushed WWF into the, the national limelight. So my experiences with Lou Albano, wrestling wise, he was already a face by the time I was watching wrestling. And you know, he actually lived in my area. So he uh he across the river from uh Poughkeepsie is Highland. And it's just a there's uh, the Mid Hudson Bridge runs in between him and he lived in Highland, New York, uh when I was a kid. And you'd actually run into him at the grocery store or McDonald's and stuff, and he was yeah, he was actually a really, really nice man. He was uh, always generous to us kids, like, you know, taking pictures and stuff like that. I wish I could find I'm sure I've got pictures with him somewhere. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to find them. They're probably in some storage unit somewhere, uh, one of my father's units. But, man, he definitely uh, he was he definitely was the first wrestler I ever met. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, Lou Albano. Yeah, it just, you know, to me, the epitome of, of old school wrestling is Lou Albano. On October 15th, 2011, in Mexico City, Mexico, John Cena teamed with Jim Ross against Michael Cole and the WWE World Champion Alberto Del Rio. And this was the main event. Not as your, exactly. You. <laughs> what is the background on this one? Uh, I, I don't know. And if I if I never find out, I don't think I'm going to be the worst for it. But I mean, I... I'm not, I will never be a Michael Cole fan and, you know, heel Michael Cole in the ring is like not something I would pay a plug Nicholas C. Um, now I will say that, and this is just my opinion. I really liked Alberto Del Rio. I thought he, I, I thought he was in the ring. The guy was superb. And I, I don't think his, his promos, his heel promos. Now when they made him a baby face, that was awful. He, he definitely did not connect as a baby face, but I thought he was a pretty decent heel. And, I had no issue with him being cha the champion. Um, but yeah, Michael Cole, I, I, I mean, I still turn out of line when I hear Michael Cole. <laughs> well, this was, let's see, Jim Ross, when did he end up leaving WWE? That was sometime not too long after this, was it? Uh, I mean, how many times did he well, leave? That's true. That's true. He's like, uh, like Billy Martin with the Yankees. <laughs> Billy's back. Billy's back. <laughs> yeah, Billy's back. Oh, Billy's gone again. You missed it. But if you wait, I'll be back. Oh yeah, I used to go to I used to go to a uh, opening day at Yankee Stadium when I was a kid every year, and uh, I, I remember that the, the parachutes coming in, the banners, Billy's back, Billy's back. Oh well. <laughs> but, you want to know? I, just my humble opinion, but if, if Billy Martin had managed the Yankees this year, they they would have made the playoffs. Yeah. So let's see what do we've got. We have. And he would have gotten fired. <laughs> exactly. Well, if Steinbrenner were here. <laughs> right. Exactly. So on October 15th, uh, 1973, in New York, New York, WWF champion Pedro Morales defeats Stan Hansen in a Texas death match. Actually, Stan stays, yeah. But that, oh. I, I think he probably did defeat Stan Hansen as well. But, um, <laughs> you know, ironically, though, Pedro would lose his title to the bad man from uh, Buzzard Creek, Oregon, uh, in Philadelphia just 47 days later. And I don't know about you. I always thought Buzzard Creek was a real place, but I've, I've since learned that it's actually a, a, a kayfabe place. I think it's 48 miles north by north northwest of uh, parts unknown. <laughs> and uh, sadly, I mean, for Stasiak's sake, he would drop the title of Bruno at Madison Square Garden nine days later. Um, so he was, you know, again, like Koloff was the, I think Koloff lasted 21 days. Uh, Stasiak lasted nine days. Uh, but somehow in those nine days, there's, he must have had at least 10,000 pictures taken uh, because every time I, I look on Facebook, there's a new picture of Stan Stasiak with the belt that I haven't seen. So he was busy. He probably didn't wrestle in those nine days. He just took pictures. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, unlike Koloff, he, that thankfully Stasiak was inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame, albeit posthumously in uh, 2018. And you know, it, that's something I want to take a second to talk about because. Dominic DiNucci, who passed away a couple of years ago. I mean, there's another man that, you know, and, you know, people people talk about Dominic DiNucci. Oh, he was just a jobber. And, it was, you know, Baron Cicluni, he was just a, just a jobber. Those guys. What, what happened was 
that they made the decision to, they call, I call it homesteading, and they did not want to travel. They both, actually, both those guys live in Pittsburgh, and they wanted to stay close to home. So the last couple of years of their career, they uh, they put people over, which they should have done. I mean, they were 50, in their 50s. But, I mean, Dominic DiNucci was, uh, he was the IWA, the Australian version of the world heavyweight champion, I think four different times. And he beat, I believe, uh, Killer Kowalski, uh, Ray Stevens, uh, King Curtis Ayukea, and Toro Tanaka. Now, those are like, you know, top 10 in the world wrestlers. Dominic DiNucci was the real deal. He won titles everywhere he went. And he even won, I think, three different uh, tag team titles in the uh, WWF. But, I mean, even when he got there, he was at, at the end of his career. But, I mean, if, if they inducted a bullet Bob Armstrong into the WWE Hall of Fame based on his body of work, it's just a damn shame somebody like a, a Danucci or an Ivan Koloff, I mean, or even Stasiak, they, they, they should have been alive for these inductions. You know, it, it's the posthumous is good for their family, but they deserve to be in, inducted while they're alive and well. Absolutely. Just my opinion. It, it keeps their name alive. But yeah, it would have been nice if it, if it was during their lifetime. But, well, we got to take another quick break. You want to send us out? We'll be right back after these commercial messages. M&J Video Games and Collectibles. Sport and non-sport cards, wrestling items, autographed items. We buy, sell, and trade. M&J Video Games and Collectibles, located at 1049 Queen Street, Southington, Connecticut. Call us at 1-860-479-9223 or 860-93-GAMES. M&J Video Games and Collectibles. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. Guess what? We're back. Hey, Benny. Good to be back. So let's start. Uh, we're getting towards the end of this. We're on uh, the last day of the week. We're on October 16th. 1989 we're in providence rhode island another king of the ring tournament result this one is the million dollar man ted dibiase oh this was excuse me 1988 the million dollar man ted dibiase wins the king of the ring tournament with a victory over randy savage so this is a this is before the king of the ring was as prevalent but soon after it becomes a you know a, a real real go-to uh event of the year uh yeah, th let's see. This would have been right before Ted DiBiase introduced the million dollar bill. Right. Because now, here's a guy who I think, uh, I mean, another guy that easily, I could have easily seen Ted DiBiase as the WWF champion, and it would not have been a stretch by any means. And I think, I think he could have carried it quite a bit, just as, you know, back in the, maybe the late seventies and, you know, when and Harley race and dusty and flair were swapping the NWA belt, I could have seen DiBiase in that mix as well. I could have easily seen him as a, as an NWA champion because he could work NWA style. And then he could also work WWF style. He was very, very talented guy. And I mean, geez, his, his mic work was as, especially as a million dollar man was, was off the charts. Like, I, so, yeah, I mean, I could have seen him as a champion easily. I laugh when I watched the older matches and I saw Hulk Hogan's debut match in WWF was against Ted DiBiase. And then 10 years later, Ted DiBiase is the million dollar man. So it's kind of funny how, how that, that came about. Right. No, again, I, I think he is one of the all-time greats. I really, really, I, I, I always enjoyed watching him. His in ring work was superb. I mean, I, he's one of those guys that I think if you, uh, you know, you want to teach an up and coming young wrestler about psychology, I, I think you you have him watch a Ted DiBiase match. Absolutely. So let's move on to 2000 in Detroit, Michigan. William Regal defeats Al Snow to win, I believe, his first WWF European Championship. Uh, this was what he had come come back from WCW. He had that early stint and then he left to, for WCW and then 
came back and this is when he really was that uh the the obnoxious <laughs> the, the obnoxious ca- uh heel character that he ends up uh endearing everybody with yeah I, you know the, the funny thing is and um I, I always got a kick out of the the canadian football league had a team in baltimore how, how does that happen it's the canadian football league and you have a team in baltimore and it like in this case you know, the, he wins the, the European championship in Detroit. I mean, I'm not the best. I'm pretty good in math. I'm, I'm like mediocre in geography, but I, I don't think Detroit somehow migrated to Europe. So I never could get that. But William Regal, man, that guy, he, that guy was a real deal. And one of my favorite matches is when he actually tried to make a match out of it with Goldberg, which ultimately wound up in him getting fired. But I, I got to tell you, I think if that was a shoot, I would have put my money on Regal. Yeah, well, Goldberg has the muscles. Regal is actually a grappler. Yeah, William Regal was like the 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 uh, second generation Billy Robinson, who you know was like the ultimate shooter. Guys like him, Carl Gotch, you know, and and Regal was a, a later iteration of those guys. Where like they knew what they were doing, and they you know they could take care of themselves in the ring. So let's fast forward to our last topic on the day. This was October 16th in 2004 in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. The legend. Stu Hart, the legend, passes away at the age of, the, at the age of 88. And uh, now besides Terry Funk, uh, Stu Hart is the most imitated man in the history of professional wrestling. Hey, uh, Bruce, uh, how you doing there? So um, you think over and, the macho the, man? <laughs> Yeah, I think everybody has a Stu Hart impersonation. I mean, everybody has – people have good Stu Hart impersonations. I mean, a lot of people have crappy macho man. But, you know, <laughs> Stu Hart, often imitated, never duplicated. But, you know, obviously the, the career of his son, Brett, and the, the tragic death of his youngest son, Owen, have kind of, like, obscured his legacy. But man, make no mistake about it, this guy is a bona, bona fide wrestling legend. I mean, he was a great professional wrestler in his own right. And then he creates Stampede Wrestling based out of Calgary. And uh, besides being a great promoter, I think his real claim to fame was being the, 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 the trainer that he was. And uh, many wrestlers told a story or two about the sheer brutality of working with Stu in the dungeon. Um, and and uh, just a small list of people that he trained. Uh, besides his own sons, were uh, Fritz von Erich, superstar Billy Graham, Chris Jericho, Edge, Christian, I think Benoit, and, you know, again, in, in addition to all his sons. And, uh, you know, few men have contributed more to professional wrestling than Stu Hart has. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think the WWE, especially in that, or WWF, especially in that mid 80s run, could have done what it did without having the uh, those wrestlers coming out of the dungeon? No, the I mean, right. I mean, you think of all the guys that I mean, another one that, that you know, made his, dogs, you know, the, called the made his bones there was a uh, bad news brown. Wow, I didn't realize that. Bad yeah, news. bad, uh, bad news brown was actually bad news Allen yeah, in uh, in in uh, stampede wrestling. He he and Bret Hart, I believe, would, would you know, I mean, they had epic, epic battles and uh, they swapped the you know, they swapped. Uh, the Calgary promotion, their their uh, their belt was the North American Championship, and Brown won it numerous times. Comes to the WWF, another one that they made into a cartoon character. I mean, they they didn't. I don't think they ever uh, said that he won a gold medal, not a gold medal, a bronze medal in judo okay. in the Olympics. I don't think they ever mentioned that. They they just you know they made him out that he was from the ghetto, which I believe he actually was. But uh, I mean, the guy was an immensely immensely talented guy. And yeah, he came out of he came out of Calgary as well. So many, so many great wrestlers came out of Calgary. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that uh, that stampede was legendary. Oh yeah, well, yeah, well, and then Vince bought it from uh, Stu, and I think he reneged on. It. He promised him some money. <laughs> and he, I think he welched on it, and never paid him. But yeah, so wow, oh, Benny, I you know we're at a we're about that time. Uh, you know, it's been it's been fun. I can't believe it's been another hour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the, the thing that excites me the most about this, doing this show, is besides the lucrative salary that you guys are paying me, um, it's, it's keep, yeah, did you ever think we would make shirts. this? Yeah. Did you ever right. think we'd make this much? It's crazy. No, no. I, yeah. I mean, there's a big crowd outside my door that I have to address when we know once we end this podcast. <laughs> but um, yeah, 
I, I don't think we'll ever run out of good material. I mean, literally, again, I, we, I think there were 22 items on the list this week. I believe there were 24 last week. And there could have easily been 100. And I have the feeling that for every seven-week period we look at, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to have to call out maybe the best 20 to 25 events. But I mean, as well, you know, people are maybe going to be listening and say, well, you missed this. Well, yeah, we probably did. And we're probably always going to miss something because – you know, we only have an hour and we try to cover as much as we can, which I think I think we did a pretty good job covering 22 uh, significant dates in history. But, yeah, I mean, it, there's always going to be something to talk about here. So let's see. So what next thing we got to promote is we've got Dan and Benny in the ring. That's good. Yeah, morning. like I said, uh, tomorrow night we have uh, we have a great show lined up. We actually have, it'll be uh, in the past. Now. Don't forget we're we're airing Wednesday. So it'll right. be, so it'll be you're airing tomorrow. Were you yes. To- yeah. We 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 uh, we're gonna be. We'll be. Uh, uh, you'll be able to listen to us uh, on Podbean at about eight o'clock, eight thirty. And like I said, it's going to be Bruno Lauer, uh, who. And if you're familiar with Memphis, you're gonna remember as downtown Bruno. If you're more of a WWE fan, you're gonna remember as Harvey Whippleman. Or if you really go back into the old days, I think his name was Dr. Leonard Spazinski, was his previous gimmick. But just a great guy, uh, full of stories, and it's going to be a very interesting show. And then, of course, come Thursday, we got to go chase that title, get it back from Phil. We have seen your guns. Look out. We're coming after you. So, And then, uh, of course, Body and the Pharaoh will be on later that night at 9 p.m. And I, I'm not sure. They do have a guest this week. I'm not sure who it is. And then uh, we'll be back next week. Well, and one more thing, too. I mean, I guess I'm going to put myself out on a limb here. Um, Brittany Brown was a great guest on uh, Dan and Benny in the Ring. Uh, she was a very, very competent wrestler who, again, now that's somebody who could have been a, a, a you know, force to be reckoned with in either the WCW or the uh, WWF. But she chose, again, she, she had a very good job, or even, it still has a job in Boston in the insurance business. And rather than give that up uh she wanted to you know keep her stability so she stayed close to home and she wrestled you know probably 20 years in the area but she's going to be my uh co-host we're going to both be co-hosts uh it's going to be true crime with the bad girl and the player so we're going to uh take a look at uh famous murder cases um and just dissect them uh, give our own takes on them, and at the end, we're going to give our own take on whether or not it, 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 did the guy really do it, or did he didn't didn't just make guy, you know, whoever the whoever the murderer was, did they really do it or not? So I believe uh, our first episode will be about Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, and uh, which is a very very controversial case. So hopefully, we're going to have that ready for you in the next couple of weeks. I can't wait. Betty sounds like fun. It's great. We got oh, all yeah. this new content coming out. So, yeah, keeping me busy, you know. <laughs> so you want to take us on out of here? Yeah. Don't forget to join us next week uh, for another episode of This Week in Pro Wrestling History. And you folks have a great week. Don't forget to tune in on Thursday night. Later.